Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, well, today for you folks, I have the story of a haunting. There's no ghosts in this video, no spooky castles, no whispers, you know, coming from the walls. No, this is the story of a person who haunted the city of Austin, Texas, striking fear into the heart of everybody who lived there, and it's a story of a race against time to stop him before he struck again. This guy had a blog, Defining My Stance. Good luck on that one. But why he did what he did, still largely, remains a mystery. In 2018, he made a name for himself. That name is Shithead. Let's give it a go. So the year was 2018, and I think looking back, things were already kind of well and truly going off the rails then, and, and COVID hadn't even hit yet. <laughs> Look forward to that, people, in this story. Just before 7 a.m. on the 2nd of March 2018, a Friday, residents of the 1100 block of Haverford Drive, Northeast Austin, were shaken awake by the sound of a loud ass explosion. Not typically the best way to start your day. Bomb wasn't, you know, the first thing to enter people's heads, as it wouldn't be, as it wouldn't be, you know, the first thing to enter most people's heads. Everybody who heard it thought it was like a car backfiring or something like that. That morning, 39-year-old Anthony Stephen House had popped out to his front porch, you know, to, to have a cigarette. Right, that morning, first smoke of the day, and as he was out there, he saw on the ground a package waiting for him. Anthony was a father, a husband, a graduate of Texas State University, and a quiet and humble guy. He didn't do small talk, and people liked him for it. After graduating university with a degree in finance, he went to work as a project manager for Texas Quarries. And on March 2nd, he was getting ready. As I said, you know, having getting ready, having his brekkie, starting a regular ass normal day. Whether he even got to the point of actually physically opening the package is unknown. But the package exploded in a blast that sent nails and large chunks of galvanized steel soaring through the air at thousands of feet per second. Anthony was blown off his feet and landed in a pool of his own blood. 911, do you need Hey, uh, I, I don't know what's going on. My neighbor, uh, something exploded or something. He's, there's blood everywhere. We need an ambulance immediately. Within seconds of the explosion, uh, neighbors were like, nah. Don't think it's a car. They raced and they found Anthony lying outside outside his home, but he, he was already gone. Mo most concern was that like Anthony's young daughter was just feet away when this happened. Road here, so a lot of unanswered questions about what happened, but again, uh, some sort of explosion this morning and one man taken to the hospital with pretty serious injuries. With terrorism being seen as a constant you know, looming threat, it's no surprise that within five minutes of the bomb going off, a phone was ringing at the FBI offices in Austin. You don't really want to mess around with this sort of stuff, is what I'm thinking, and maybe probably what you're thinking too. Analysts from the FBI and ATF arrived and began sifting through thousands of pieces of debris and found a whole bunch of helpful things when trying to determine what the shit just happened, and nobody knew what the shit just happened. Like, by all accounts, Anthony Stephen House, and he went by Stephen most of the time. Regular, nice, quiet, humble guy. A man anyone would be proud to know and a real pillar of his community. A dedicated husband, a dedicated father, and a very successful guy, a star athlete. Always achieved great results academically before working in construction, and more recently, he had been working or dabbling in finance. He was even in the process of setting up his own hedge fund. Criminal career? That's what I say to that. I say that. The bomb that had killed Stephen had been hand-delivered and left there purposely on the porch outside his house. Special delivery! That made the targeting of Stephen, you know, seem even more, you know, suspect. Somebody had purposely left it there. It hadn't been, like, sent through the mail or anything like that. An early theory in the aftermath of what happened was that the, the bomb, the, this homemade uh, pipe bomb explosive, was actually meant for one of Stephen's neighbors who was a known drug dealer and it had just been accidentally left outside Stevens' house. Part of the investigation is what was the cause of the explosion? What type of a device may it have been? APD units arrived on scene and again, it was apparent that we had an explosive incident that had occurred. And what you're seeing behind us is a very detailed investigation into that incident. We're working diligently to understand this incident and to understand why it had occurred. Police, though, they initially were like, maybe it, was, maybe it was just one of them good old accidents. You know, somebody just happened to make pipe, nail, bomb, and um, 
you know, as you, it's a prank, bro. The reason they speculated it was a possible accident was to calm people down. Because you have Anthony Stephen Harris with no criminal record, no known associates who were criminal. It must have been an accident, right? After all, right, if the bomb was sent to a target, or even more terrifying, a completely random person, then that means the bomber is still out there. Anyone could be next. The bomb could, right now, be in transit to its next victim. Twist, he was and it was. Oh, I need a EMS, please. Something exploded in the house. And my grandfather is bleeding everywhere. What exactly happened that caused this? They opened a package from outside and they exploded in the house. Any hope of this being a one and done accident or successfully killing a specific target? Well, that evaporated into the ether when 10 days later, not one, but two more bombs detonated across the city of Austin. Born on May 26, 2000, Draylen William Mason may have only been 17, but by March 2018 was already more accomplished than many adults with far more years than a clock. Even his peers, you know, saw him as something of a role model. By that age, he was already a black belt in, in martial arts and he'd been accepted into a load of uh, music colleges and music schools to play upright bass. Like he was athlete, the academic, the musician, he had it all. So who would want to hurt Draylen is a question everybody would soon be asking. Just like the first explosion, Draylen had been killed by a blast from a bomb at around 6.45 a.m. This time on the 4800 block of Old Fort Hill Drive in East Austin. 20 minutes from where Anthony Stephen House had been killed. Just as with you know, Anthony Stephen House, the, the package had been left outside his home, but this time Draylen actually picked it up and brought it inside to his house, left it on the kitchen table. It had exploded as soon as he tried to open it. The explosion also severely injured his mother, Shamika Wilson. So now you have two bombs in the space of 10 days across the city. And at this point, it was absolutely undeniable that the, both were related. I mean, well, first of all, Coinky dink, I think not, my friends, in this one. And secondly, when the authorities began sifting through the remains and the rubble, there was too many similar similarities between the bombs for it not to have been made by the same person. Perhaps what is even more alarming about this incident is that police are now tying this case with another deadly package explosion that happened on March 2nd. We are looking at these incidents as being related based on similarities that we have seen in the initial evidence that we have on hand here today compared to what we found on the scene of that explosion that took place uh, a week back. Tragedy again and again and it did not take long for the inevitable to happen. In fact, the same day the bomb went off in Draylen's house, another bomb went off. What's going on guys? Hey guys, back away, back away. Agents were still working at the scene of bomb number two. When the call came in, there had been a turd bombing. Just before noon, at around 11.50 a.m., 75-year-old Esperanza Herrera was taking care of her 93-year-old mother, Mary, when she saw that a package had been left outside their house. Esperanza, you know, seeing this, her mother always received care packages and all that kind of stuff, so she didn't even think twice about going inside, picking it up, bringing it back in home. Once again, on the kitchen table, it exploded. The second victim of March 12th, grandmother of eight, Esperanza, she stood at just four foot seven inches tall, but was regarded as being the foundation of her entire family, the person everyone would turn to in a crisis. She didn't have a chance to escape, and like Anthony House and Draylen Mason, she was blown off her feet and critically injured. Unlike the prior victims though, Esperanza would actually be, would actually survive uh, the bombing. First responders thought she wasn't going to pull through, a nail had gone through her cheek and her arm had been severely damaged, but the worst and most life-threatening injuries were to her stomach. It took months in the hospital and every ounce of fight in her, but she eventually recovered, though left with some serious physical and psychological scars. She's extremely lucky, though, to survive. Uh, this younger and stronger people hadn't. So it was after the third bomb altogether, second in a day, that the investigation kicked into high gear March 12th, 2018. Someone is leaving package bombs at homes. It has happened three times this month, leaving two people dead and two others wounded. The latest explosions happened today at homes a few miles apart. The FBI and ATF are investigating. They began sweeping the entire city. Someone is sending out bombs. And it appeared, like they, they knew the tree were linked, the bomb makers were, but the victims weren't linked at all. It seemed random. And more than 500 agents would end up taking part in a, in a manhunt across several agencies. And this began to grip the entire country at this point. 
Now investigators had two dead and two wounded and no idea why in the hell it was happening. It appeared to be random or at least semi-random. Uh, two of the victims were male, they both were black, the third victim was a, was a Hispanic female. What about a hate crime? Well, we know that the victims of these three incidents, two were African American and one was Hispanic. So again, we're not going to rule out the possibility that that may be a motive. Fear began to spread across Austin. No one knew if and when the bomber would strike next and where it would be. As it would turn out though, the next bomb wasn't actually on its way anywhere. And that made it all the more scary. Like Esperanza though, this time the two victims involved would be able to, would, would survive and be able to walk away from it. They were extremely lucky. Hey, we have a confirmed shrapnel. Hey, Dooley, grab me a piece of tape right here. It's a trip wire. This is the kind of stuff I've seen in Iraq. Tell him you to stop right there. Corporal, can you grab me something and mark this? It's a tripwire. You see the line? Six days after the 12th March bombs detonated, on March 18th, in an upscale residential neighborhood of Travis County in the southwest of Austin, two young men were walking along the sidewalk when they were suddenly blown back off their feet and for a brief moment, engulfed in flames. Both men escaped with their lives but did receive serious injuries to their legs. This time, the bomb wasn't a pipe bomb on a timer delay or on a fuse left outside somebody's house. This time, he had a, a wire, like a fishing line across the pavement. These two lads were just walking along the path, walking along the sidewalk, when they, a trip wire. This time, the victim selection was 100% random. There's no way the bomber could have known who was walking down the sidewalk at that particular time a fourth bomb. They are clearly dealing with a serial bomber and whoever that is, they think is trying to send a message. Belief that we are now dealing with someone who's using trip wires shows a higher level of sophistication, a higher level of skill. The trip wire explosive could have been placed literally anywhere. And in an extra piece of shithousery, as if there was any more needed, the bomb had been hidden under a sign that read, drive like your kids live here. That sign hadn't been there before. It had been bought specifically to cover the IED and wasn't exactly a common thing. That made identifying the point of sale a lot easier. And soon after, the police, ATF, FBI, and a dozen other agencies had surveillance footage of their primary suspect. However, no sooner did, you know, when agents, they were starting to feel like, all right, we think we have a guy, let's, we can start working with something right from, from now on. And you know, okay, we're getting there. Then news came in of fourth, no, fifth bombing this time. Jeez, I mean, there's so many bombs. On March 20th at 1245 AM, news of another bomb started trickling through. Bomb number five detonated as it was being relayed on a conveyor belt at a sorting facility in Schertz, a small town just outside of San Antonio. The package in question was found to be on its way back to Austin after it was shipped from Austin. A strange turn of events that had federal investigators push for more awareness and vigilance. Who the intended recipient of this bomb was supposed to be, it's never been revealed. Nobody ended up being hurt when the bomb detonated in the sorting facility, but now the level of worry just raised because now the bomber was sending out packages via FedEx, not hand delivering them, not placing them himself. He was sending them just through the mail. It was an escalation. Now the risk of the bomber had grown exponentially. There could be bombs all across the country for all they knew. Authorities knew they needed to find the person responsible and end this like yesterday. Though I think they were probably thinking that when the first bomb went off. But before they could even get to that, agents discovered another thing. You know that bomb that went off in the FedEx sorting facility? Well, looking at the tracking number, it, there had been two packages. They had no idea where the other package that they that had shipped with it was. So there was another bomb out there. They searched and searched and searched, finally finding the package, right? And it had been scheduled for delivery the very next day. Doing an x-ray, yeah, there was another bomb here. This one was on its way to a church before they nabbed it. Now though, investigators, they raced to the FedEx facility where these packages had been dropped off to, to try and find their CCD footage to see if they could get the guy. The bomber wore a disguise, but the cashier was able to give them a description of a young man with a bad complexion. The CCTV of the parking lot proved a lot more useful as it showed the man getting into a red Ford Ranger truck. Investigators had seen the same red Ford Ranger truck before on the parking lot CCTV of a Home Depot. 
the same Home Depot where the Drive Like Your Kids Live Here sign had been bought. By the way, the name he was sending the packages under? Kelly Kilmore, if you can believe that. Finally, they knew they were about to get the name and the face of this fucko. The CCTV footage, the car, the license plate, the DMV gave them that name. So who exactly was this chippy chappy, uh, you know, in the in CCTV? I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of expecting this is like some prepper, grizzled, Kaczynski type. Not, no, no. This was a kid who had done it all. 23-year-old Mark Anthony Condit, he grew up in Fluggerville, Texas. Flugger, that sounds like an illness. Into an extremely close-knit and religious family, having two younger sisters. After being homeschooled by mother, Condit eventually attended an Austin Community College between 2010 and 2012 to study business administration, though he did not graduate. According to those who knew him, he was a nice, quiet guy. He liked to debate, but uh, wasn't especially political or anything like that. In a blog he published as part of a political science class, Condit labelled himself as not that politically inclined. My name is Mark Condit. I enjoy cycling, parkour, parkour, tennis, reading, and listening to music. I am not that politically inclined. I view myself as a conservative, but I don't think I have enough information to defend my stance as well as it should be defended. The reasons I'm taking this class is because I want to understand the US government and hope that it will help clarify my stance and then defend it. In six posts from January to March 2012, he argued against same-sex marriage, doing the old, oh, are they gonna marry dogs next? At doing that old argument, he was also in favor of the death penalty, but he was also in favor of ending sex offender registries, so. Now the blog though was written six years before all this happened, so who knows what his views were at the time he began his, you know, actual campaign of terror. He seemed pretty indiscriminate with who he targeted. He worked for his parents, I mean, of course he did. Nothing wrong with working for your parents, but I just got a feeling Mark Anthony Connett was someone who didn't get away from them too much at all. That was the Condit Development Group. Mark worked in purchasing. He had bought a house with his father a year before the bombings in 2017. His new neighbours, they described him as very quiet and a bit of a loner, but always polite. Like with many spree and serial killers, it seems no one had a clue he was behind the bombings that had gone off in Austin. And now he was the subject of a huge manhunt. By March 20th, they had everything they needed. With Condit's house under surveillance, agents from the FBI pre prepared to execute a warrant on his property. With SWAT preparing to go in by the morning, suddenly there was a break. Shortly after 1am, Condit's phone had pinged at a cell tower. He turned his cell phone back on. Officers from SWAT raced to the location, a hotel parking lot, and they found him there sitting in his car. Before they could move their armoured cars into place, Condit's car started moving and in seconds officers had resolved to stop him no matter the cost to themselves. This was a race now. The officers were watching and Mark knew it, he put the pedal to the floor. All hell broke loose over the space of a few minutes. Police SWAT officers piled into their vehicle and managed to ram Condit's and force him to a stop. But obviously, given the nature of the crime he was wanted for, the situation was insanely dangerous even with his car stopped. The officers knew it was very likely that Condit was armed, and they needed to be cautious. Their caution proved to be life-saving when, as they approached the vehicle, calling on Condit to get out of the car, as they did so, Condit, I'm guessing seeing no way out and not wanting to be taken alive, detonated a homemade explosive device inside the car, similar to those he'd sent out to his victims. The blast killed Condit and injured an officer who was hurt after the force of the explosion blew him off his feet. Got an explosion, got an explosion inside the vehicle. The Austin bombings is one of those real shitty cases where the perpetrator and the killer kind of escaped justice by taking the coward's way out. Though Condit was stopped and he died, I, I say a lot of people would think, yeah, well, he got off pretty lightly comparing, you know, what he did. The main question though, of course, being why? Why did he send out bombs just completely randomly to people? Why, why would you do something like that? He had some strong views, but he never once called for violence. Now we know of. In addition to discovering the remnant components that he'd used to construct the deadly devices, Mark had left behind a 25 minute video confession. Now, the video has never been made public, it's never been released, there was no trial, so there was no reason to release uh, his confession video. Though the police chief would say it was it was an outcry of, of a challenged young man talking about the challenges in his life that led him to this point. 
On this recording, the suspect describes the six bombs that he constructed with a level of specificity that he identified the differences among those six bombs. We have told you all along that they all had similarities, which they did as far as specific components, but there were also differences between them. And on this recording, he identified what those differences were. I know everybody is interested in a motive and understanding why, and we are never going to be able to put a ration behind these acts. But what I can tell you, having listened to that recording, he does not at all mention anything about terrorism, nor does he mention anything about hate. But instead, it is the outcry of a very uh, challenged young man talking about challenges in his personal life that led him to this point. Oh, poor him, bless. He's the real victim here, I suppose. I mean, Mark, he had some challenges, so. God, was this a bitch, a little bitch of like major proportions. I'm glad his video was never released because I guarantee you it doesn't really matter what he would say in this video, no matter how, how con convincing he was or his conviction, it doesn't matter. What he did means we don't have to give a shit about what he said or thought. It was him being a pussy, end of story. One detective said that Condit explicitly stated that he liked the trill of killing and intended to continue with quotes like, I wish I was sorry, but I am not self-describing himself as a psychopath, and that if he knew the police were closing in on him, his initial plan was to walk into a crowded McDonald's and blow himself up in there. Throughout it all, he allegedly, even though he described himself as a psycho, and a piece of shit, and a bitch, he never once said though why he did it. He just was like, just like doing it. So, okay. Good thing you're gone, <laughs> Killed two, maimed a lot of others, and was gonna keep trying. Psychopath. The biggest problem was how long it took to catch him, and then when they did, he went out on his own, his own way. And why he did it, but I mean, at this point, some people just don't need a reason to hate the world. But we got a pretty good reason to hate Mark Condit. Thank you so much for watching, uh, it means the world to me that you're here watching the old video. Thank you, um, here listen, you know, drill. Next old video, couple of days, so please uh, give it a good when it's out. Links in the description for Instagram, Twitter, Patreon, bonus videos there, all that sort of thing. You know the whole story. Listen, take care of each other, and please take care of yourselves. Because I love you. Mike out.